heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. Caroline Hyde's off today. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up on the program, we'll bring you the latest updates from the Israel-Hamas war and speak with Israel's first ever chief technology officer. And Microsoft and Activision close the deal after nearly two years of fighting for the $69 billion transaction to gain full approval. We have full coverage ahead. Plus, we'll bring you more from our inaugural Screen Time event in Hollywood and hear from the CEOs of Netflix, YouTube, and also the head of the Kardashian clan. Uh, first, a very quick check in on financial markets. We are very conscious of what is happening in the Middle East, the focus on the war between Israel and Hamas. Your equity picture, Nasdaq 100 down 1.2, 1.3% on a weekly basis, just on track for a weekly gain. It's third successive weekly gain, longest run of weekly gains going back to early June. Let's see if that's where that holds. U.S. 10-year yield, 4.6%. That's kind of in the region of where we've been. Is oil continues to climb. And actually, if you're in the tech sector, remember a lot of the conversation right now, oil and energy, if we continue to rise higher, what does that mean for inflation? And in turn, what does that mean for the Fed? And what does that mean for the technology sector? Bitcoin at around 27,000 US dollars per token. How many times have I said that so far in recent weeks and months? The main story is still what's happening in the Middle East. I want to get straight to the latest developments in the Israel-Hamas war. Joining us from Tel Aviv is Bloomberg correspondent Oliver Crook. And Oliver, let's be frank, a lot has happened this Friday. It has been completely intense 24 hours. It really started at about 5.30, 6 o'clock this morning when we got that initial sort of evacu evacuation order from the Israeli Defense Forces where they told uh, the residents of Gaza City in northern Gaza that they should leave the area. And that is sort of how the day began. And the UN said that that is basically an impossibility. It's an important um, to get these people out, says the Israeli Defense Forces, because they want to minimize civilian um, casualties. But we're talking about displacement of 1.1 million people. That is about half of the uh, the population of Gaza. And to then compress them into about 50 percent of the space that they began with is something that the U.N. is saying is going to turn tragedy into catastrophe. And the tragedy we're talking about is a death toll that has exceeded 1,500 people in Gaza. The healthcare system is entirely overwhelmed. They have no water, electricity, food, internet, and Israel overnight continued to strike 750 military targets. And of course, this is all in response to the attacks on Saturday that left, now we know, 1,300 Israelis dead, um, mostly on Saturday and mostly civilians. Uh, Oliver, it's a frankly incredible list of developments. As you say, it's been a sort of 24-hour process. There is a bigger picture question about the Middle East, and, and you have been on the ground there in Tel Aviv, but also thinking about neighbors and, and what else is in the news cycle. Completely. The geopolitical complexities here are absolutely vast. And, you know, so it comes with a lot of support from Western allies to Israel. So it started with Blinken yesterday. We have Ursula von der Leyen here today, the U.S. Defense Secretary also here today. But yesterday, Blinken's message, there were really two of them. There was one of sort of total and unconditional support, but then a second message. And that message is about how Israel goes about taking out Hamas is going to be very important. What Blinken said is that it's so important that every possible precaution to avoid harming civilians is taken and that we mourn the loss of every single innocent life. This obviously is the background to all of the meetings that Blinken has conducted today. Right now, Anthony Blinken, he just gave a press conference with the um, Qatari foreign minister. He's in Qatar. He's meeting with the Saudis, Egyptians, um, uh, you know, the UAE. And this is the conversation that you're going to have everywhere. Just as Israelis were seeing all these horrific pictures on their phones and that sort of put pressure on the government even more, all of the Arab world is seeing what's going on in Gaza. And you've seen protests in the streets of Iraq where there have been burning uh, Israeli flags, but running a, a, a Palestinian flags. The West Bank, there have been protests, Lebanon, Pakistan, yeah. Yemen. And Iran has been meeting with the leadership and with Hezbollah and Hamas in Lebanon today. So really, a really very complex situation. And again, these, com these countries are going to come under immense pressure themselves. Later on in the program, we are going to continue to have the conversation about social media. You know, Bloomberg has reported extensively. We have discussed on this program that 
there's video content on lots of platforms that is circulating that purports to be one thing and in fact is another. It is not what it purports to be. And so, you know, experts, the government urging caution on that front. But there's an issue of logistics and mechanics as well, Oliver, that you on the ground are starting to, to cover and understand. An evacuation and then, you know, defense, Iron Dome, the role of technology. What have you learned since arriving in Tel Aviv? Yeah, so there is the question of Iron Dome and could it, you know, potentially be depleted or overwhelmed and this sort of hangs over. We understand that some of the sort of ammunition for Iron Dome from the U.S. supplies that is here in Israel was transferred today. We know that the U.S. has sent equipment yesterday and that there is um, more on the way, but there is not, it's not really known how many rockets Hezbollah has, for example, in Lebanon. And many of these are, are far range rockets. I mean, I, I had the first air raid siren go off today in Tel Aviv just about two hours ago. That's the first one that we've had so far, and that apparently was fired from Gaza. But this really highlights the risk, particularly um, as Israel seemingly is gearing up for what you know, could be a ground invasion. You have more than 300,000 troops that are stationed right near Gaza. The government has not said whether or not they're going to launch that uh, attack yet. But again, they've asked to evacuate the northern part of the city. And if they do, in fact, attack, that just opens up a whole other set of questions about how they go about uh, this. And also they relinquish many of their technological and military advantages once they get into a sort of urban combat zone. And then even if they do eliminate Hamas, what do they do next? What is the exit strategy? What comes after that? These are all the questions that we're going to have to be asking for the next days and weeks. Uh, Bloomberg television correspondent on the ground in Tel Aviv, Oliver Crook. Stay tuned to Bloomberg, all channels, but Bloomberg television in the coming days. Oliver, thank you for reporting. We stay with the story of the Israel-Hamas war, but think about technology. Joining us now is Yonatan Adiri, who served previously as Israel's first CTO. And, and Yonatan, let's start there. I think Iron Dome in particular. Um, you, your assessment of the role technology is playing in the Israeli response to the weekend's events? Well, first of all, Ed, thank you, thank you for having me uh, on the show. Um, the, 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 the events started on uh, Saturday morning uh, with this ISIS-type massacre of, of innocent civilians, now to only get north of 1,200 people, have really challenged Israel. Uh, but, you know, if to paraphrase from the American uh, national anthem, Israel is, is the, the land of the free and home of the resilient. And I'm sure that with technology, um, we're going to persevere, we're going to win this one and continue to contribute uh, to the way in which global uh, uh, humanity is dealing with its, with its top challenges through technology. Um, this is not just Israel's technology and defense. Israel's a powerhouse of technology in solving and tackling some of the biggest problems facing humanity. And, and our ecosystem is, is uh, committed uh, to that, to its role uh, within this global context. Yonatan, one area of the technology discussion is in intelligence and data. And, and, a, and a debate that's taken place on the show this week was about the preparedness of Israeli intelligence forces. Um, we had one academic on the show who said it wasn't a lack of intelligence, but simply a lack of uh, imagination at the scale of what Hamas would, would be able to have done. Please reflect on your experience as, as the chief technology officer of the country and, and share with our audience what you know Israel had in place uh, in recent times in the, in the areas of defense intelligence. Well, I think, that, I think you're totally right, Ed, uh, spot on. Uh, Israel has deployed numerous technologies. I think the core one, as you've discussed with Oliver, was, was um, Iron Dome. I remember in May 2009, uh, I was on President Harris's team as we came to meet President Obama in the White House right after the inauguration. Technology was a big part of that. Defense technology was a big part of that. But I think you are, you are totally right about the uh, limitations of Intelligence uh, technologies as to the imagination gap. The intelligence technologies provide us with data. Uh, they provide us with uh, signals, if you will, but it is at the end of the day, the human uh, interpreter that needs to put in the signal and noise ratio and to figure out what's the plausible uh, uh, scenario. If you will, I would like to uh, equate that with what happened in 9-11. America, the NSA, the CIA, the FBI, we know that from 
the investigative committee post 9-11 has had quite a, a significant degree of intelligence, uh, but it was about putting those bits and pieces together and anticipating that people would actually go into the cockpit and transform uh, an airliner into a live bomb and you know crush it into uh, into the, the the twin towers and to other uh, targets within the U.S. So I think you're spot on on that. Uh, you can be a superpower the size of the U.S. You can be a technology superpower the size of Israel and deploy you know front line technologies. But at the end of the day, it's about the ability to to imagine you know, what could be that human factor usage of yes. um, of those signals uh, in a terror context. Jonathan, I would just point out that that viewpoint, that it was a lack of imagination rather than intelligence, was the viewpoint of Professor Charles Freilich of Columbia, a uh, former yeah. intelligence advisor to your country, Israel, not, not my own. We, yeah. We've talked a lot about the sort of hard power, hardware technology response and software response Let's talk a bit about the industry. You yourself are a startup founder. Is Israel's economy has deep roots in technology. What is it like right now to operate a startup, a small startup in Israel, with what's happening in the country? Well, I think you know fun fundamentally, Israel's had a in over the last just week a ten trillion dollar worth of market cap vote of confidence, if you will, between Microsoft, Apple, Google. Uh, Amazon, NVIDIA, who all have deployed uh, significant parts of their R&D. Intel has their um, uh, autonomous car brain here in Israel. Uh, Apple runs part of its design of chipsets and semiconductors. So does Intel. Again, uh, Google has a, a, a very uh, profound base of R&D in Israel. They have all Andy Jassy at Amazon, Sundar Pichai, uh, and, and uh, Jensen Huang. The leadership of those companies have um, uh, unequivocally supported Israel and the ecosystem here. Um, if yes. you add two to three trillion dollars more of support in what what's going on here in the life sciences industry, in the cyberspace industry, I would say that part of what enables our conversation right now, and for the viewers at home, uh, from the moment they woke up this morning until right now, they would have probably used an Israeli technology. So we continue to perform, we continue to uh, develop, and. Part of that is, you know, how do we manage the emergency situation here in Israel and allocating the empathy yes. to our workforce, to the broader community, but how do we remain committed to solving humanity's greatest challenges, even when we're under war, under attack of thousands of rockets, in this insidious attack, uh, kind of ISIS class from, from last Saturday. That's what we have to balance, and that's what we're committed to do. Uh, Jonathan Adiri, founder and CEO of Healthy.io, but also former CTO of Israel, the first CTO of Israel. Thank you for your time. And he mentioned Jensen Huang, a programming note that NVIDIA had been due to hold its AI summit in Tel Aviv on Sunday, Monday, but it was cancelled given the events of the week. Now, coming up here on Bloomberg Technology, we turn to M&A as the biggest deal in gaming history has finally come to fruition after UK regulators approved Microsoft's revised office offer to buy Activision Blizzard. We will have all the details next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Microsoft have brought forward this this fundamental concession, this fundamental restructure of the deal, which now puts all of the cloud streaming rights in relation to Activision's games content, all of the games that are available now, but also any content that's created over the next 15 years. And those rights are put in the hands of Ubisoft, an independent competitor. And that breaks the stranglehold that we were concerned Microsoft would have over this important cloud gaming sector. That was the UK CMA CEO, Sarah Cardle, on the deal, joining our colleagues earlier today. For more, let's turn to Cecilia D'Anastasio, who's our video game reporter here at Bloomberg. OK, it's happened. It's done. It's happened. But it's, done. it's happened. Let, let, let's go back to the, the origin of this, because everyone forgets. Because the discussion about, from the regulators is about cloud. This is about mobile gaming, right? What is it that Microsoft now is going to have to do with Activision to catch up in mobile gaming? Yeah, a lot has changed in the mobile gaming landscape since the deal 
was announced. Mobile gaming has been a behemoth for a long time. Microsoft has been behind on capitalizing on interest in mobile games, casual games, free games for smartphones. And now with Candy Crush, which Activision makes, they have in their hands, I mean, one of the most, if not the most, blockbuster mobile games um, in the West. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because at the same time, the mobile gaming industry, since this deal was announced, has experienced a contraction it's oversaturated so it'll it'll be interesting to see how how microsoft leverages all of their power to capitalize on candy crush and other mobile games under activision what do we learn about the mechanics of what happens next i think a headline that i saw on the bloomberg terminal is that bobby kotick is going to leave the company or i guess the joint entity after 2023 yeah so bobby has led the company for decades and brought it to where it was today. And he has said that he will step down at the end of this year. And until that time, we'll be working under Microsoft's gaming chief, uh, Phil Spencer, who uh, became famous through stewardship of Xbox. When last it was disclosed, Activision had like 13,000 employees. This deal has dragged on taking Activision and merging it with Microsoft is not going to be straightforward. Just as a, a beat reporter who knows this industry inside and out, how do you think that's going to go? Wow. I mean, consolidating two companies is never easy for two companies like this, especially with a Microsoft that has so many different capabilities across so many different platforms and technologies. I think it will be it will be an immense challenge. Um, Microsoft is not immediately adding Activision's games to Game Pass, which I think, you know, has been one of the really big exciting things that Phil Spencer and Bobby have talked about um, over the last couple of years. And that should show you that, you know, there there's a lot to get in place before we can really see how big and impactful this deal will be for Microsoft. All right, Bloomberg Cecilia, De Anastasio, all across this deal for months and months and months. Thank you very much. Now coming up, what the future of streaming holds. Our conversation with Netflix co-CEO Ted Sarandos out of Bloomberg Screen Time. That's next. This is Bloomberg. All these traveling experiences that we've been doing, uh, we're going to pull them together and, and start to build out these more permanent experiences. Um, this is a concept of one, something we're calling Netflix House. We're one of the largest sports platforms out there if you think about YouTube. Everything from our YouTube creators that are focused on sports to uh, the consumption of highlights from all of these leagues. You know, we had the most amazing experience at the E! Network with NBC, Comcast, and that whole group for many, many years. And then I think it was just time to um, have a new chapter. Mm -hmm. And I really felt like streaming was in the cards for us. I want to make sure that when people come to my Instagram or whatever, that they know that they're not being tried to be sold something all the time. I do want to touch on the uh, sale of ABC stations. Have you already submitted a bid or you're looking to uh, submit a bid? Well, I submitted a bid. I texted it to Bob. Okay. Okay. Okay, time for Talking Tech. First up, the king of K-pop is building the next BTS in LA. Bong shi Hock, founder and chairman of Hybe, wants to replicate the formula that changed the pop music industry while the world's biggest boy band is on hiatus. He also discussed the role of AI in K-pop with Bloomberg's Suhi Kim and Lucas Shaw. One for the K-pop fans now, Netflix co-CEO Ted Sarandos also spoke at the Bloomberg Screen Time event in L.A. on a wide range of topics, including the actor's strike, cracking down on password sharing and reflecting on the pace of streaming in the medium industry. Have a listen.
saved the, this industry. Um, because where we were heading at that time, remember, we, we started this business of streaming. We started licensing content from the networks. And at the time that we were licensing, we could only get what was available, which was nothing. So we were licensing from the bottom of the barrel, things that had no revenue for anybody. Uh, shows that didn't get to syndication, things that weren't otherwise sold. Kind of like what uh, Tubi and some of the AVOD services yeah, did when right. they came around, we, where they started. And yeah. we gave it away with the DVD business. Uh, and it was you got what you paid for back then. <laughs> uh, but I'd say what happened was that's created a whole new revenue stream for the networks and the studios. It created a whole new residual revenue stream for actors and performers who performed in those projects that were sitting on the shelf. Uh, and really kind of got the ball rolling in a way that, you know, that we've, you know, obviously I think these, these things can take decades to build, but with their big meaningful businesses, they, you know, that's, that's a good investment. And I'd say good, good business for us, it's, a, you know, $32 billion of revenue and $6 billion of profit. And we've been growing the business pretty dramatically and pretty quick. We grew pretty quickly. Uh, we're not growing as fast right now as we want to, but we are still growing the business. So I'm curious on that point because yeah. you, you guys, in your remarks, I think your last earnings report talked about how you still aren't growing as quickly as you'd like to. There was a point in time where every year, like clockwork, Netflix would basically add 25 million to 30 million customers. Yeah. That obviously, post-pandemic, has come way down. Yeah. What are you doing about that? And do you think you can get back to the level of growth you were at three, four years ago? Look, I think the key to it is you know, growing, the, the re growing revenue. And I think for us, it, that's a combination of you know, putting a great product on the board. Uh, when you talk about is streaming a good business, it is if you do it well. And I think I would say the, uh, the team at Netflix, in terms of uh, the, the programming, Bella Bajari and her team are phenomenal at, at focusing on what people love. Uh, and, and their creative team is great at, at delivering for what people love. Um, the team that delivers the UI experience. Remember, something that happens at Netflix that's almost impossible anywhere else, and I'd say because of our, our distribution footprint and our recommendations, that you have the ability, if you're telling a story from Korea, to be the biggest television show in the world. That can only happen on Netflix. Um, I, and I, it's not just taking obscurity and making it big. Imagine uh, somebody as big uh, uh, as David Beckham. Uh, who releases his documentary on Netflix and in days grows his social media following by half a million people. Um, and I think this happens over and over again, the combination of our di distribution footprint and recommendation, and which I think is what distinguishes the business. And the way you grow it is by keep doing that better and better. And the opportunity to grow it is enormous. We've, uh, we're about 10% of screen time when people are using, uh, watching on their TV and at, uh, at home, uh, about 10% in our most penetrated markets like the US. Uh, around the world are significantly smaller. Uh, we're about 5% of consumer spending in the businesses that we're in, uh, which is you know, paid television, advertising supported television, and games. Uh, and so as you look at that, of the air, and we're just in our infancy in those businesses, and about 5% of consumer spending. So we have a ton of room to grow. For our TV and radio audiences worldwide, it's official. Microsoft's completed its $69 billion purchase of Activision Blizzard after nearly two years fighting with global regulators who threatened to halt and indeed stop the deal. This is the biggest ever acquisition in the video games industry. I'm delighted to bring in Activision Blizzard CEO Bobby Kotick. Uh, Bobby, good afternoon and, and, and thank you for your time joining us from New York City. Thanks for having me, Ed. Uh, Bobby, you and I have, have been talking about the video games industry. We've been talking about cloud, but at the origin of this deal was mobile gaming. And I just ask you to reflect if now that it's all said and done, Microsoft will be able to make some progress in mobile gaming. Look, uh, I think there were a lot of great reasons for this uh, merger. Mobile is an important part. I think one of the things that we've all benefited from is as smartphones became the dominant form of delivery devices for video games, we started to see the democratization of video games. In, you know, for 
most of the 30 some odd years I've been running the company, we made games for consoles and for PCs. And those were really limited to people who were middle class consumers in developed countries. And over the last 10 years, what we've seen is the dramatic expansion of games to Today, we have uh, players, over 350 million players in 190 countries. And so the, this dramatic transformation that's taken place and building this much larger audience of players is something that I think Microsoft will continue to uh, develop and enhance. And we're really excited about the future of gaming as a result. Bobby, I know that you also engage with the gamers, the community. We asked the questions to the community, what would you ask Bobby Kotick? I think the resounding question is, what is it that Microsoft could offer Activision gamers playing your different titles that you guys couldn't offer on your own if you'd remained a standalone company? Well, I can't say that there's any specific thing that, um, that Microsoft can, will offer that we couldn't. What I would say is what's the most important is access to talent. As the market continues to grow, as you see the intensified competition that's coming from so many companies with aspirations to make and sell video games, one of the things that we were realizing is that access to talent was going to be increasingly more competitive and difficult. And it's the same type of talent, you know, AI and machine learning talent, data analytics, user interface and user experience type talent that is now in such high demand. And I think our hope is that over time we'll be able to attract people from the enterprise side of Microsoft to be excited about working in gaming. But um, I think on a combined basis it gives us a greater chance to compete against the many, many competitors that uh, are out there today. That's the technology side, and, and to all great technologies, there's a cost. I remember you saying that at, at times, like, Activision wasn't looking to sell. It didn't need to. When this deal came together in, in the, the outset, was it because the financial position had changed and Activision did need to sell? No. Uh, we, ha you know, we, we're, we're, uh, we merged with a stellar balance sheet and strong financial performance. It really was... You know, our principal responsibility is providing a return to our stakeholders. And when Microsoft approached us, they made a, an offer that was in the best interest of the shareholders. 98% of the shareholders voted for the transaction. And uh, so that's, you know, that's our principal responsibility as a, a board and for me as a CEO. The exciting thing is that we actually sold to a company that has a history almost as long as ours of making video games. And if you think back to the early years of Flight Simulator, you know, there's a company that has been in the games industry for a long time. Uh, they, you know, the, people are passionate about gaming at the company. And so when you think about a perfect home for the next, you know, generation of gaming, Microsoft is going to be a fantastic place for our incredibly talented people to have opportunities. Uh, Bobby, how did this deal come together? What's the origin story? Well, it, it came together pretty quickly. Satya and Phil uh, gave me a call and um, said that they were really excited and enthusiastic about this as an opportunity. And uh, is it something that our board would consider? And uh, I, of course, said, yeah, absolutely. And you know, it didn't take very long after that to see the logic of it. Um, you know, it's a, it's a perfect combination. And like I said, given the intense competition that you're seeing from, you know, every big technology company, not just, you know, in the U.S. and Europe, but in China and Japan, I think that, that you know, this gives us on a combined basis the opportunities to develop uh, nascent franchises, to take advantage of some of the titles in the library that haven't actually been uh, developed in a long time. You know, right now, is a, it's a really great moment in gaming. There is enormous innovation taking place. We're about to launch a new Call of Duty game in the next few weeks and a new season of Diablo, and you can actually see the changes and the benefits of new technology in games like Call of Duty. 
we're seeing an expanded reach of games like Candy Crush, to, which now you know, is probably something like 130 million monthly active users. And so this is just an exciting time to be in the gaming business and an even more exciting time now that we have this transaction completed with Microsoft. A welcome to our global Bloomberg television and radio audiences. We're speaking with Bobby Kotick, Activision CEO. Uh, but it was announced, Bobby, that you will work with Microsoft under Phil Spencer just through to the end of 2023. This is the biggest deal in video games history. Activision has more than 10,000 staff. Is that enough time? Or, 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 I guess my question, why, why not stay on longer? Uh, you have run this company for almost three decades. Well, it's pro probably appropriate for me be sitting here at Bloomberg right now, but um, you know, Mike Bloomberg is one of the most inspiring philanthropists that I have ever had the pleasure to know. And uh, you know, I just turned 60 last year, and I'm personally really excited about the opportunity to help reform K through 12 education, think about That's how right. do we reduce uh, hatred and intolerance in the world, focus on bridging relationships with countries like China. Um, so there are these philanthropic interests that I've always had that I really want to focus on and make my priority today. And a reminder to our global television and radio audience that Mike Bloomberg is the founder and majority owner of Bloomberg LP, which of course owns Bloomberg Television. Uh, Bobby, 24 hours ago, uh, an industry colleague of yours, Laura Miele of, of Electronic Arts, who I believe you know well, was on the show. On the close of this deal, EA will become sort of the largest independent studio left. And yet she gave a glowing review of the deal. You know, I'm paraphrasing, but basically said, this puts video games on the map in the context of the entertainment industry. But she also conceded that EA is a target, right? And, and I wondered if you'd reflect on the, the years of negotiating with regulators to get this deal done, if you think that an EA can re remain de independent or if this opens the door to consolidation. Well, EA is a fantastic company. I started my career as a developer of software for Electronic Arts. And so I will always have a great reverence and respect uh, an appreciation for the company. It, you know, it's an extraordinary company. And, um, you know, they, I think they can remain independent and continue to be as successful as they've been since they were founded in 1983. And, um, uh, you know, we're lucky to have companies like Electronic Arts who have what we have, which is a workforce that is enthusiastic and passionate and so committed to advancing the art form of gaming. That give me, give me a, a real answer here, Bobby, that you know, Microsoft buys Activision. Is this kind of the signal of where we're at with the video games industry, that the studios, the creators, have to live within a much bigger technology entity because of AI, the need for cloud compute? Well, I, I don't think that's the case at all. I mean, you look at an example of a company like Roblox. You know, it's... Uh, you know, it was, Good example. it was a startup not less than 10 years ago, and they've built an extraordinary business. There's enormous access to capital for video game startups still today. I think, in fact, probably more venture capital has gone into video game companies in the last few years than ever before. The competitive environment still favors great entrepreneurs with big ideas and visions and the ability to execute. and. So I think that you know, whether you're large or small, there's going to be uh, you know, continued opportunities for innovation and new types of companies. I think for a company like ours, uh, what we just did was in the best interest of the shareholders and our almost 15,000 incredibly talented employees around the world. So if somebody buys EA, I get it's a hypothetical it leaves very few options. What do you think that entity looks like? I'm not sure I really understand the question, Ed. Well, it took Microsoft to spend $70 billion to buy Activision. If, if there's going to be consolidation in your industry, and you've led in this industry for three decades, right? Who do you think could buy 
Apple based on your experience, uh, by EA, based on your, without putting words in your mouth, based on your experience of the last two years? Oh, I wouldn't want to speculate. I mean, there are just so many, you know, business combinations that are possible. And, uh, but I, I don't have an informed view of that sitting here today. Phil Spencer, what task does he have to take all of the people working at Activision and bring them into Microsoft? Do you think that there's anything he can learn from your company? Look, we have a fantastic company with an extraordinarily talented uh, workforce. People are passionate, motivated, enthusiastic, excited about this merger. And Phil is an extraordinary leader. I couldn't think of a better person to give the reins to for the business. Uh, you know, he is a passionate gamer. He's been uh, involved in this industry uh, since 1989. Uh, you know, he's incredibly technically capable, visionary leader. People love working with him. And I think it was actually one of the really appealing parts of this transaction was to know that the people that I've worked with for three decades are going to have a leader who is extraordinarily capable and passionate and compassionate and will do a wonderful job leading the combined companies. We're speaking with Bobby Kotick, the Activision Blizzard CEO here on Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg Radio. And Bobby, as we discussed, you will stay until the end of the year and then focus, it sounds like, on philanthropy. But to those that don't know you as well, you know, the video games industry and market is huge, but there will be people that don't know your backstory. It started in software, right? It started, uh, there's a tie to, to the early days of Apple. You've, you've been able to work with Microsoft now, and the story of the year is generative AI. And I wondered if you could just give us some illustrative examples of how you think their work in AI is going to read through to video game development. No, no matter how niche, NPCs, customization. Look, AI is going to, in fact, when you think about the talent that it will be required to move the art form forward and to be able to create new innovation, AI and machine learning are going to be the important new technologies that are going to be transformative for the future uh, types of games that we'll create. There are so many... Uh, important applications, whether it's generating art or an, an animation, or onboarding players, or creating greater experiences for players through better tools like Player Match. There, there is an enormous amount of uh, benefit that will come from the evolution of AI. It's the early innings, though, of really figuring out how to translate what is the available technology today into practical solutions for gaming. But I think this is one of the big areas of opportunity for us on a combined basis, because uh, Microsoft is you know, clearly right now, I think, the leader in AI and machine learning. So, Ed, I, I wanted to say thank you very much for the opportunity to have me today. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to continuing the conversation. And it was very, very generous of you to include me. All right, Bobby Kotick, Activision CEO for now. Thank you. Thank you this very much. This is Bloomberg Ed. Technology. Thank you. All these traveling experiences that we've been doing, uh, we're going to pull them together and, and start to build out these more permanent experiences. Um, this is a concept of one, something we're calling Netflix House. We're one of the largest sports platforms out there if you think about YouTube. Everything from our YouTube creators that are focused on sports to uh, the consumption of highlights from all of these leagues. You know, we had the most amazing experience at the E! Network with NBC, Comcast, and that whole group for many, many years. And then I think it was just time to um, have a new chapter. Mm -hmm. And I really felt like streaming was in the cards for us. I want to make sure that when people come to my 
Instagram or whatever, that they know that they're not being tried to be sold something all the time. I do want to touch on the uh, sale of ABC stations. Have you already submitted a bid or you're looking to uh, submit a bid? Well, I submitted a bid. I texted it to Bob. Okay. Okay. Okay, let's go back to some of the Bloomberg screen time highlights, some of which you were just watching. Starting with YouTube CEO Neil Moen speaking about his priorities when it comes to live sports competitions, following YouTube TV, of course, winning the right to broadcast the NFL Sunday ticket games back in December. He sat down with Bloomberg's Lucas Shaw to talk about what's going on. It's uh, very early on. We're a few weeks into um, the season, but I feel really, really good. Um, I feel that... Uh, the first and foremost, my priorities literally from the day that we signed the deal um, was on the user experience, our fan experience on YouTube, joint fans of the NFL and YouTube. Uh, we have uh, millions and millions of sports fans on the platform, and the whole point of Sunday Ticket was to super serve those fans. And so everything from you know what gets all the headlines, which is uh, multi-view and you know kind of uh, four games at once and what have you, to um, to latency, to the clarity of the picture, and then all the features and things like that that we have, um, that users of YouTube TV have known, to, known and loved uh, on Sunday Ticket. And so really, really focusing on that. And that has gone, Knockwood, uh, really, really well from all the feedback that we've seen. So I feel great about uh, the product that we put out there. You like the multi-view? I use the multi-view uh, every week myself. Um, I like the multi-view, especially the one with uh, with Red Zone in one of the windows for me. And that's like, you know, as a huge sports fan, like that is like kind of like the perfect Nirvana experience for me. You talked about being a, a platform for sports and having different rights. As I unfairly mentioned at the top, you are a big NBA fan. Those rights are coming up. Are you interested? Um, so what I will say is uh, we're taking it one step at a time. Right now, the NFL uh, Sunday ticket is a... Uh, is a big area of focus for us. And again, as I said, getting that viewer experience right, um, making that game day experience on Sunday flawless and seamless. And you should expect from us a lot more innovation there in terms of products, in terms of creator integrations, all the things that our fans, especially younger fans of the NFL on YouTube expect. You should see more of that through the season and in the many seasons to come. So that's the focus. Um, you know, regarding the NBA, they have been longtime partners. They ha they operate one of the largest channels on our platform. Uh, every, I mean, my 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 15 year old is a huge sports fan, just like me. He watches a lot of NBA highlights, and he watch he watches them on YouTube through the lens and the analysis of a lot of his uh, favorite creators. And so, we have a long partnership with them. But in terms of our focus right now, it's about this NFL experience. That was YouTube CEO Neil Moen at our Bloomberg Screen Time event in Hollywood, Los Angeles. You can catch more of that conversation online. Wrapping up our coverage from the inaugural Bloomberg Screen Time event in Hollywood, we sat down with the matriarch of the Kardashian family and discussed what led to their pivot to streaming. I really felt like streaming was in the cards for us and my family really wanted to try and um, tried to take a stab at that because that was really the future in our minds. We wanted to elevate what we were doing and, um, and streamline the show and have it have a new audience yeah. with, you know, it's now it's Hulu and Dis Disney Plus around the rest of the world. And the show's always been in so many countries and so many languages and we have such an amazing following and that transition for us we were very lucky because we kept that audience and gained new audience new friends and we still have a wonderful um, relationship over at E they're still airing some of our shows and so it makes it nice because now it's a much broader audience you keep saying lucky and it's interesting because it wasn't luck <laughs> that first brought you to thinking about infomercials, about seeing what perhaps you hadn't seen at the time, which was a champion you were married to that you wanted to had to le lean on that that relationship that Bruce at that time had with people who appreciated his sports, and then you led into infomercials, then suddenly it became linear television, then the transition to screening. How have you always been able to see basically where the consumer's going? 
I think I, I, I do like to lean into opportunity, and I do like to think about what the next thing could look like. And in those days when it was about, OK, we have bills to pay, kids in school, and things going on, and how is this going to happen? And I just had to really figure it out. And when I created Keeping Up with the Kardashians and brought it to Ryan Seacrest, and we brought it to E, and they said yes, and 30 days later we were filming, and I was just very persistent about the direction I knew I wanted to go in and I think we were prepared for, but it takes a village and I think what is so, I mean, when I say lucky, I, I feel lucky, I feel blessed to have opportunity that I can you know, extract this amazing career out of, you know, and also share that with my family and they have taken this and run with it. You know, when you think about somebody in the entertainment business, usually they do it and they thrive and grow and perform on their own. And with me, we get to do it all together. Mm -hmm. It's not just one of us trying to do it all by ourselves and create this world for the whole family, but we all get to have a part in our, our present and our future and what we're going to do. So there's lots of family meetings, and we discuss what next steps are going to be. And the kids are, I mean, they're, they've got amazing work ethic, and they never stop. So I feel like it, you know, it takes a village. It takes all of us together. And I think that's the magic. Chris Jenner there from our first ever screen time event in Los Angeles. Well, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Don't forget, check out the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and, of course, on all of the Bloomberg platforms. That wraps it up for what's frankly been one massive week in the world of technology. Caroline's off today. She'll be back next week. But from here in San Francisco, in Silicon Valley, wherever you are in the world, this is Bloomberg Technology. Thank you.